Well, good morning and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, this is informal. Uh, you're welcome to stop and ask questions as you wish. Uh, when uh, Nick and Brady contacted us originally, I said, well, uh, okay, so you want me to tell how this, the business started? Yeah, well, can you send me a template of kind of what you want to see? Well, you're the first one, so you had to come up with your own. So, uh, so this is my idea of what you would probably want to see or know uh, Softronics is a small business. Uh, somebody commented earlier that, uh, well, I'm not familiar with you. We fly under the radar deliberately, and uh, you'll see why. What I'm going to do is just kind of give you the uh, story of how we came to be. Who are we? What's our business model? I'm giving you a one-page profile of my background because in a small business, it has everything to do with the skills, knowledge, connections of the guy who starts it, guy or gal. And so that does make a difference, and you'll see how that weaves into the thing. I'm gonna, this is kind of a story uh, that I'm going to tell. Uh, I don't I'm not a believer presentation style and doing Technicolor Sesame Street graphics presentations. All it has in here are words that prompt me what to tell you in the story. So just so there's no shocks here, there won't be any cartoons or audio. Uh, kind of a description of the journey that we went through in growing a company from nothing up. Uh, lessons that we learned, and there were quite a few valuable lessons that I'm happy to share. Uh, I'm doing, and of course, we'll have questions uh, uh, at the end. You're welcome to stay. I had no particular cutoff or requirement to be anywhere else uh, this morning. Uh, I do feel that those of us who've been through this do have an obligation to help other people, and that's what we do. That's what I do. Uh, we're mostly uh, retired people, but that's getting ahead of the story a little bit. So uh, let's launch in there. Who are we? Well, what we put on our uh, proposals and uh, uh, to customers are a proven reputation and quick reaction means we work fast. Don't stand on ceremony. State-of-the-art electronic design, manufacture, and repair. We design it, we build it, and we take care of it for as long as the customer owns it. Uh, Iowa veteran-owned business incorporated 1984, so we've lasted a while. Uh, we have over a thousand staff years of engineering experience, and that comes primarily from the fact that we have a lot of retired people that works out well. We'll talk about that in more in a few minutes. We're AS9100 certified, which is a higher level of ISO 9000. That is required in our business. They want to know, the customer wants to know, are you ISO certified? Yes, we are. AS9100 simply means that we are certified to build equipment that goes on Boeing airliners that you fly on. That's what that means. Uh, uh, certified all kinds of things. DCAA is the Defense Contract Audit Agency. We are actually a defense contractor. That's why we fly under the radar. That's why you've never heard of us. Uh, we don't do any kind of advertising, have banners at the ballpark or anything. Why? Uh, we sell to the government and to the military and uh, there's no point uh, uh, other than just community support and doing any advertising. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, and we are set up as a C Corp. And that's another thing that there's a lot of interesting questions that uh, other startups ask is, well, why not an LLC? Why not an S Corp? Why did you guys go to the trouble of a C Corp? You know, if you go to sell the business later, oh, da, 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 da. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, there is a good reason to keep your personal taxes at arm's length from the company. And that's the difference between a C Corp and an LLC and S Corp is that those are tangled up with your personal finances. If you go to a C Corp, the C Corp has the tax liabilities, not you personally. And that, it, that can be a big deal. Our business model, 
and uh, you have to decide up front what is it that you want to do uh, we are first and foremost out of the box thinkers and inventors we have customers come to us and say here's what we want to do uh, can you can you build it next week uh, that's usually how the question starts out no we can't do it by next week but uh, well can you do it and then we get into uh, you generally a couple month discussion of the uh, laws of physics and uh, price and what we can actually do versus what they want but we tend to be uh, the guys who do all the strange things that nobody else wants to or can do and uh, we stick to radio and electronics in general and radio specifically because uh, that's our expertise it's my expertise and uh, that's what I built the company around we try very carefully to stick to our knitting. We don't go out and do build uh, cookie ovens for a bakery. Uh, that's kind of out of our business uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, we're trying to stay small. The goal of the company is not to grow it into a $10 billion a year company, go public, and then retire and buy an island in the Pacific. That's not the goal. The goal is really to have some fun. Remember, we're mostly retired guys that started this. We checked our block. We did all the stuff at a big corporation. Now we want to have a little fun doing the things we weren't allowed to do. And we do. We'll take risks. We'll do crazy stuff that nobody else wants to do. And we want to stay under the 50 employee federal limit because all the regulations come thundering down on your head if you get over 50 employees. Uh, and no, our goal is not to be billionaires and IPO out of it. The idea is to have a, a small business that is sustaining, that just keep going on forever. And right now with the customer base and the products we have that you never see, we're set up right now for about another 20 year run so far just with what we have. So it'll just keep going under the radar forever and keep everybody employed and happy and keep our customers happy. Uh, we maintain a flexible supply chain. Very important principle, don't try to do everything yourself in-house. Do what you're good at and hire somebody who's better at it for the stuff you don't know how to do. Um, and you'll see that theme recur throughout what I'm going to talk about. Our focus is on the aerospace business. And in particular, our focus is on the government business very few competitors. Nobody wants to do business with the government. Like, oh, no, don't talk to me about doing business with the government. I did it for 34 years at Collins, ran a business unit, among other things. No big deal. All you have to do is understand the rules. Read the rule book, not hard to do. Everybody's scared off by that. It's great for us, no competition. So we picked our niche this is our model. We design it, we manufacture it, and we do all the after sales support for it, all in one. That chain and is, is, the, is part of the secret to what we're doing. When you're designing something, one of the uh, well-known rules uh, and axioms in the uh, design business is that design is a break-even business. If you're a design shop that's going to design custom solutions for people, the best you're ever going to do is break even on expenses. The money is in manufacturing. Even more money is in support. Try getting your car fixed. Try buying spare parts for your car. That's where the money is. Designing this stuff, you don't make a profit on that. Okay, so that's our business model. Design it, build it, support it, stay small, no grandiose uh, uh, visions, and stick to our knitting. Okay, founder profile, I promised I'd make, keep it brief. Uh, I've been in the business for 52 years. Uh, I started out as a kid as a radio ham. And I knew I loved electronics from the very first day I played with a radio and said, that's what I want to do. I knew what I wanted to do. There was no doubt. My dad was a plumber. Uh, I grew up in the uh, New York City metropolitan area. 
And uh, I grew up building things, taking things apart, whatever. So I was an engineer just from the very day, I was, a few days after I was born, I got into the mechanics of things. Uh, I've gotten uh, double E uh, degrees and a, a master's in business. I am one of the few New Jersey refugees that was hired by Collins back in the 60s. I think there were only six people from the East Coast at Collins when I came out here. I was one of them. It was a tough sell to the East Coast crowd. Uh, the thing that, was, that I discovered after I retired and started this, I guess started this business up full time was how well cross-trained I'd been by Collins. And I say cross-trained accidentally. Now, uh, they had, oh, in the 70s and 80s, they started rotation programs. They'd pick, so they'd anoint some people and say, all right, you're going to be our next generation. We're going to rotate you through. Well, before they thought about, the, before they thought about doing that, I kind of got shifted from job to job to job to job to job to job and uh, kind of actually got better than the rotation people did. I got dumped into everything. And uh, the interesting thing was that after my first 10 years there, um, and I started out just a radio designer, so I could solder, build, design, ran a little group, ran some projects, was happily doing engineering type work that I really, was really my goal in hiring in there. Uh, and I came to Collins from New Jersey because Collins was the number one name in radio in the world. That's why I came out here. Uh, I had I'd never been in the Midwest. Was kind of, I got a lot of funny stories about that, but uh, <laughs> including uh, one of the things that if you grow up, grow up in the uh, East Coast, New York area, the idea of delicatessens and deli, deli sandwiches and stuff, when Hy-Vee opened the big super Hy-Vee here and they had the meat counter and I went up there and I saw, hey, they got pastrami here. I've had a pastrami sandwich for 20 years. So I go up to the counter, take my number and wait there. And the high school gal that was working back there, I say like a half pound of the pastrami. Half pound of pastrami, right. So just a minute, walks in the back and you hear a little voice, Fred, what's pastrami? <laughs> It's that stuff right there. <laughs> anyway, um, I got a, got a great deal of experience, and after my first 10 years, I accidentally got sucked into um, the classified world with the government. And um, I began running the unit that became their skunk works, the equivalent of a skunk works. That's actually what I did most of my career. That's why I'm used to being under the radar and, and staying that way because you're required to do that. But in doing that, I was everything. I was out on the front line with the customer. I was out in the field with the customer. I was the, the director of the business unit. I was the field service guy. I was everything. And boy, let me tell you, there's no better training than being forced to take your product and go out in the field with the customer elbow to elbow in the middle of nowhere. That's what I did. Retire, retired in 03. I had incorporated the company earlier, just doing a little hobby work. I just got a little bored now and then, so I did a little consulting. But I just really wasn't ready to stop working, but I had enough politics for one lifetime. And so I left and I recruited some other part-timers and uh, retirees and uh, away we went. So the background is I'm a radio guy. Guess what Softronics is? It's a radio company. There's a connection. And I had already been cross-trained in everything I needed to know to run a business, small business. Although I didn't realize that when I started. I figured that out pretty quick as we started running into things. Our customers are all over the place. Uh, we work with all the big guys. We are a supplier and designer to Collins. Uh, Collins subcontracts an unbelievable amount of stuff that we used to do there. And I find that kind of sad in a way, but that's the way it is. And we work with a lot of big government people, at least ones I can put on there. Uh, Codan is our first international customer. They're down in Australia, and so we got an international component. We build and ship stuff uh, to them and for them also. 
Growth journey, okay. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of go chronologically. Feel free to ask questions again uh, as we go here. Uh, 2003, when I retired on a Friday, I walked, uh, showed up Monday morning in my rented office uh, for Softronics. Uh, it was uh, pretty austere. We already had two government contracts and something called the SBIR program that the government has, Small Business Innovation Research Program. It's a program where they'll uh, give you, they list, uh, they publish a list, it used to be every quarter, now it's three times a year. They publish a list of the most intractable invention problems that the various government agencies have that have been unsolved. Nobody's been able to figure out how to do it, big guys or anybody. And so they publish a list of this and they, the program was uh, deliberately established about 20 plus years ago to go find the smart guy in his garage or basement who's got a great idea for sol solving something that's unsolved that nobody else thought of. That is the point of the program. And all the rules are set up to do that. That's how I got started. I had a contract from NOAA uh, the weather service to do a uh, really unusual piece of electronics for their uh, atmospheric observing system. And so we spent two years working on that and we got another military uh, study contact right behind that. Started out with three part-time and three uh, full-time guys sitting in the middle of a huge empty uh, room. Uh, our, we rented a building, as a matter of fact, we rented the old dairy out at uh, 35th and Moonier. We rented that part of that from Tim Mooney. And uh, we were paying $4 per square foot per year for rent. Now, that's austere as rent goes, let me assure you. Building was austere too, but that's okay. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we learned pretty quickly, and uh, we didn't learn it, but we just did it. We we're all cheapskates. So yeah, we had a pretty low rent building. It wasn't exactly uh, the Taj Mahal, but hey, it was a building. It had heat, it had air conditioning. Uh, we were one of Welter Furniture's best customers. No air on chairs and brand new cubes and stuff like that. Uh, bought some used uh, Dell computers, bought our equipment from eBay and uh, for about uh, five to 10 cents on a dollar for what we'd pay if we got new stuff. And then I put in about 25000 over the first two years of my own money to just get it started. You have to get started somehow. But uh, number one advice, piece of advice is if you're going to start up, don't go design and build a building. Sorry about your new buildings and industrial park. Don't go buy and build a building. Don't go buy new furniture. Don't buy new equipment. Don't go out and buy a brand new foosball table. Just be frugal when you start. There's time for that later. Uh, to date, I think we've only bought three new pieces of equipment in 20 years. Everything else we buy used. If you buy one or two generations older of electronic test equipment, you get it for about 10 or 20 percent of the price of a new one. Well, I can live with one or two generations old. Just it's kind of like a washing machine. New washing machines have computers in them and TV screens and 22 different variables when all you want to do is wash a load of clothes with soap in it. Well, all those frills are nice. The test equipment's the same way. You don't need all that. You know what you're doing. You can do the same thing with the old equipment. I ran everything, hub and spoke, because I knew how to do everything. Uh, we had a company, a company credit card uh, we, and a checking account that I got from the Collins Credit Union. Uh, since I had been banking with them for 30 some years, I went to them and said, hey, I went there first and said, hey, can, we, uh, can I get a uh, credit card and something, a credit, uh, uh, checking account going for a small business? And they were very helpful and we did. And that is also an important first connection. We set up a web domain and email. Now, I, I, uh, I've worked with a lot of startup businesses when I was at Collins because in the Skunk Works business, the small guys with the bright idea were the ones you were looking for to do this really weird stuff. And um, I watched 
them go through a lot of trials and tribulations. Let me assure you, and I say this tongue in cheek, nothing impresses an important customer more than giving him an email address that is Klingon293 at marijuanacentral.com. <laughs> Spend $12 a year and get a domain that says, hey, I'm real and I'm professional. I'm not really a Klingon, okay? You would be utterly flabbergasted at how often that happens. And the customers, we found out, will go and look up your website and they'll go look up and they'll just quietly, are these guys real or is this just a, a joke of some kind? Spend the $12 for the domain. And at this point, the first year we were set up, we were running with a couple of contracts, we were succeeding and we were having fun. And that was, and that's a kind of a shot at one of the mantras that they teach at the uh, Collins uh, management courses. And that is uh, when you're assessing whether or not you should take on a job or try to pursue it, they say, is it real? Is it worth it? Can we win? And we added a fourth one, is it fun? because we already did the non-fun stuff, so now we're ready to do something else. All right, that was 2003. Jump forward, six year, another three years there, 2006, we had more SBIR contracts. We, we kind of got the SBIR thing down to a, a formula. Uh, we also took on some commercial customers for the first time, and we got a new government customer outside of the SBIR program. We won those as a result of the Rolodex. Now, Kristen, who's my second in command, said, they're not gonna know what a Rolodex is. And uh, I said, well, I don't know, it depends what the audience is. It was, uh, yeah, it was a, road, a, heart, uh, a bunch of cards, that somebody, it's a trade name, uh, and they were on a, a horizontal rotary thing in alphabetical order. And you kept all of your contacts and names, kind of like business cards, on this Rolodex. And uh, the thing that we found out, kind of suspected, but uh, got confirmed pretty quick, is the government people that I worked with for 34 years, they weren't doing business with Rockwell Collins. They were doing business with Bob Sternowski. And when I left there, I kept getting phone calls. They found my forwarding number and they just got called, hey, Bob, how you doing? Hey, can you build this? We need some of these. Uh, can you still repair these things? You know, Collins told us they didn't want to do it anymore. Can you do it? Oh, sure. We ended up never advertising. We ended up with people calling, seeking us out based on our prior experience with them and saying, hey, can you do more? Can you fix it? Can you build more of this 40-year-old radio? which has been of one of our most profitable activities. And an interesting tidbit for why that, and, and again, I'm just trying to give you the big picture of what we did, sample of one, but how we got to be where we are, um, building a 40-year-old radio. Well, they, they, Collins couldn't build them anymore. The parts were obsolete, you couldn't get them. Um, we had the same problem, except that we'd said, well, we'll just lift up the cover and put some different parts under it, and it'll do the same, you'll never know the difference. And they said, that's good. All it has to do is work like it used to and plug into the same place in an airplane. The reason was the $50,000 radio, and that's kind of the atmosphere that we work in, is $10,000 to $100,000 a piece. Um, to rewire an airplane and certify it for use is $25 million. So paying us to make a new radio that plugs into the same spot is the difference between 25 million and 50,000. That was a good deal. We made that extremely well and we still do. That's our primary business is replacing old stuff by putting the newest technology into it. At this point, we'd grown a bit. We had eight part-timers, five full-time people, still lots of room in the dairy, uh, a lot of empty floor space. We got into manufacturing stuff with our commercial customers 
uh, we were making a little control modules that went on the cellular base stations on all your cell towers. You see those white sticks on top of the tower. That's the cellular antenna. We made like a quarter million control modules that go inside those antennas. Never touched them. We designed them, tested them, had some, a couple of different companies here in Iowa manufacture them and ship them directly to the customer. And we collected our markup off the top. So that, that's what we did. We decided that we didn't want to have a factory. We didn't want to buy a million dollars worth of automated manufacturing equipment. We're going to do what we're good at, design the stuff, have somebody else manufacture it. We still get the market up. That was our profit. And that was the money, the profit we had to plow into other things. I still ran everything but the design work. I started to uh, kind of split that out. Uh, still in the hub and spoke uh, organization. We were expanding, but still pretty well under control. Things are, things are going pretty well at this point. Okay, we're going to skip forward a little bit more. 2009, another three years. Now we we're really growing. We had six, uh, six SBIR contracts going, more commercial customers, more government customers. We're up to 20 people, and at this point, we would added two administrative people. Now, one of the things I knew from Collins uh, and my experience there, as well as the uh, MBA class, is that as an organization grows, you have to add infrastructure and overhead. You don't have a choice. You're going to die if you don't. So we had a bookkeeper and we had an administrator that would uh, offload a bunch of stuff from me uh, and the others and let, us, let those people focus on what they were good at, which is mainly the technical end of the business, and offload the business end to someone else. And the bookkeeper was a huge help and the administrator was, just took care of everything else that needed to be done. That worked out well. We we're still doing volume manufacturing. We added, added more things uh, to our uh, manufacturing, uh, manufacturing repertoire. We are privately held, I, I should have mentioned that earlier, I own the company and all the stock of the C-Corp. So by owning all the stock, I own the company. Uh, so we don't disclose financials. We are not required to disclose financials. We don't disclose financials, but we're doing a couple million a year. It was, uh, it was going pretty well. Uh, we spun off uh, some new products from SBIR and formed a new company. And that was uh, Midwest Microwave Solutions. Uh, some of the key employees went with that. We did that because of the strategy and product split as from one of the SBIR programs, two of them actually. We'd invented some very unique things for the military uh, government business. And uh, the gentleman that was kind of the champion for that said, you know, we really ought to just bet the whole company on that. And I said, mm, I don't like that. And so we agreed that, well, if you think it needs that much emphasis and has that much opportunity, let's just split things and you take that and with our blessings and enjoy and we'll just stick to what we're doing. And we did. And so we just spawned another company and they just took the technology and went off in, in uh, their own way. I still ran everything at this point, but it was getting a little bit, uh, it was starting to get kind of busy here. Uh, we were expanding and things were starting to get crazy, and which is one of the reasons we split that off. Jump forward a little bit more, 2015. Now we had a lot of stuff going on. We were up to 25 to 30 people, part-timers kind of came and went. Part-timers are great because they only cost you money when they're working. And the rest of the time they go off boating, mowing the lawn or whatever else they want to do, particularly if you use retired people. This place is filled, this area is filled with people like that. Use them. That is a really, really efficient way to work. And they love it. And we paid really good money to the part-timers who just come in for five hours a week. And, and most of your part-timers, you, you were able to connect through your Collins? Yes, to, or somebody knew of it. Virtually every employee at Collins 
was known by at least one employee already. Uh, so we knew everybody we were hiring. We were not hiring pigs in a poke, as they say. Uh, just, well, I don't know what this guy's going to do when we get him here. We knew him. In many cases, we'd worked with him for 20 or 30 years. So that, that was part of a strategy is we, everybody, everyone was pre-vetted because somebody knew them. And that was, turned out to be very valuable. Uh, things kind of proceeded.